Well, I feel like I'm such an anti-climax after everything else. <laughs> wow, what an amazing story and an inspiring story and a reminder of why we're here today. And that is that the support for the College of Biblical Studies is not just about educating people, it's about changing Houston and ultimately changing the world. Education is a wonderful thing. I think all of us ought to have a little bit of it. Some people need a lot more of it. But if a person is only educated in the mind and not educated in the spirit, if a person is only more aware of the knowledge of things and not the knowledge of he who created the things, if all a person knows is that which can be sensed by the five senses and never understands the God of the universe, then a person's education is incredibly incomplete. I've often said that I'd much better be surrounded by people who are smart than people who are well-educated. I know a lot of people who are well-educated that just aren't that smart. <laughs> I know some people who are really, really smart, they're maybe not that well-educated. Now, if you can get some people who are both well-educated and smart, now you really got something. And for those of you that wonder what is the difference between being well-educated and smart, I'll give you a little story. There's a makeup artist in Little Rock, Arkansas, by the name of Nancy Shepard. And she is uh, probably the first call makeup artist for any television shoot or if there's a movie that's coming to be filmed in the state, they'll always call Nancy first. Nancy has a high school education, but is very good at what she does. One night she was out with some girlfriends. They were sitting around a restaurant table. She had ridden with one of them. They were all talking and having a good time, but she had a real early job the next morning and she wanted to head on home. So she asked one of the friends who she'd ridden with, would she go ahead and take her home? She says, oh, not now, it's a little early. We wanna sit and talk a while. Well, Nancy didn't wanna sit around talking all night. She wanted to get some sleep. So she called the local cab company and found that they were gonna charge her $25 to take a cab home. And folks in Little Rock, it's not that big. You could rent a car for less than 25 bucks. Nancy, being the frugal person she was, said, I'm not doing that. So she sat there a minute, looked out of the window of the restaurant and noticed that across the parking lot, there was a Papa John's pizza. <laughs> she called and said, I'd like to order a pizza for delivery. And they said, well, where would you like it delivered? She said, my house, and I want to ride home with it. I'll be right there. And for $12, Nancy got a large pizza and a ride home. Now, she may not be well-educated, but that's smart. What I love about the College of Biblical Studies, they're empowering people, not only to be well-educated, but to be smart. And I'm talking a whole lot smarter than just simply knowing how to get home but how people can really get home. Yeah. Home to the Lord. Home to where there's peace in one's heart. And what is remarkable is that the ministry that is being carried out by the people who graduate from the College of Biblical Studies is not typically going to be in the largest churches across America. It may not be the TV preachers and there's nothing wrong with that. Thank God for them and for the extraordinary ministry that God uses them to perform. But it's often gonna be in the ministry that is gonna to go to the underbelly of Houston, Texas and the underbelly of urban plights across this country. And it will be touching the untouchable and embracing those who have never been hugged and loving those who have never, ever, ever felt loved. We sometimes think of street people as people who are hopelessly lost. But folks, in God's economy, there is no such thing as a person who is hopelessly lost. Just a person who has not yet been introduced to the one who can find anybody and bring them to himself. We celebrate the life of people like Stephen who could have easily been one of those people wearing the white jumpsuit in Huntsville.
During my ten and a half years as a governor, I oversaw our state prison system. I visited every one of them. People sometimes would say, ah, oh, these prisoners, they have it so easy. They just sit around and watching TV. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I can arrange for you to have a night there if you'd like. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you would not consider it the Hilton level quality of lodging. And no, it is not sitting around watching television. And even if it were as delightful as you present it to be, which I can assure you from having been there, it isn't. May I just tell you that the one thing that is different about the times when I've gone into the prison and so many of my predecessors is that I did get to leave. <laughs> Some of you are a little slow on that one. It's taking you a while. That's because in Arkansas, we used to say the five most feared words of an Arkansas politician are these, will the defendant please rise? <laughs> In fact, when you're an elected official and they say, how many, how many terms have you served? They always say, in office or prison. <laughs> the fact is, in every person's life, the only thing that makes life truly worth living the next day is knowing that that emptiness is filled by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the College of Biblical Studies is challenging people not only to know Christ and to be deepened in the Word, but to understand the strategy and the tactics of taking His truth and going to the places where angels fear to tread in the underbelly of Houston, Texas, and in urban centers across the world. Several years ago, I commissioned one of my staff members on the governor's staff to, uh, to do a little study. I wanted to just try to better understand the economics of what happens when people uh, live a life that is really separated from good judgment, from good values. And I wanted to put a, a number to it because a lot of people that I meet say, you know what, I, I'm really just about wanting to make sure that we cut taxes and save money and trim back the government. I don't want to hear all this moral stuff. Just leave the morality out of it. Let's just focus on taxes. Okay. Here's what I came to realize. The reason government is so expensive is because there has been a breakdown in the character of our communities. Let me make it real clear. There is no way to have a government that is less expensive until we have a government and a people who are more moral. People don't go to prison for singing too loud in church on Sunday. People don't go to prison because they drank too many Dr. Peppers. By the way, there was a lady who this week celebrated her 104th birthday. And they asked her, what was the secret? She said, and this is a true story, she drinks three Dr. Peppers every day. And they ask her about that. She says, well, every doctor I've ever had says that it'll kill me, but I've outlived all of them. <laughs> the only doctor she hasn't outlived is Dr. Pepper at 104 years old. The fact is, without morality, our government gets more and more expensive. I find people all the time that want their tax bills to be lowered, but they don't want to invest in organizations like the College of Biblical Studies because somehow they don't understand that it makes a lot more sense to build a fence at the top of the hill than it costs to build a trauma center at the bottom. If we prevent people from falling off the hill, it is not as expensive as it is to try to put the pieces back together once they've fallen off. And when you heard the figures of how much it costs to incarcerate a kid, to take an adult, it's not as expensive as, as a juvenile. Juveniles are very expensive, over $100,000 a year in most states. But by the way, it's no bargain to incarcerate an adult. And the average is over 30000 Do you realize that it costs more money to put a person in prison in Texas, or for that matter, any other state in the country? More money to put a person in prison for one year than it would to put a person in college and pay all the tuition, 
room and board, buy their books, and give them spending money. A college education is a far better investment than a prison sentence. And especially, especially if it helps that person to become empowered to go into the neighborhoods and to present the gospel of Christ and to see lives changed. Because every time a person falls through the net of morality and is unable to live by the rules of society, it gets expensive. So I, I ask my staff to just take a, a couple of hypothetical kids. One is a kid who grows up with a mother and a father who both have a basic college education and live on a school teacher's salary. Now this is a person who grows up, stable mother and father home, graduates high school, goes to college, gets a job as a teacher. And accounting even for inflation over the course of his or her career, we, we tallied up how much money this person would contribute back to the state. And the figure was over the course of that person's lifetime, that person would actually contribute, even on that salary, about $250,000 a year in all, in terms of ultimate value, taxes, and all the other contributions to the community, to the, to the state. Then we created another hypothetical kid. This is a kid who grows up in a broken home, a child who lives most of his life in poverty, which is more likely than not if he does grow up in a broken home, single parent home, no father in the home, or perhaps no mother in the home. Because the fact is a child growing up without a father, broken home, 75% more likely to be a juvenile delinquent, 70% more likely to be a drug addict, 80% more likely to get in trouble and never graduate school. I, I know you're gonna probably tell me about the exceptions. I get that, my wife was brought up by a single mom. She had four brothers and sisters, a single mom brought up five kids, they turned out okay, but I'm telling you that's the exception. It is not the norm. So we figured up with this kid who comes up in that atmosphere, and assuming, like so many others in his category, he ends up getting into trouble, has issues with uh, juvenile detention as a kid, and then graduates to the adult population of the Arkansas Department of Corrections. What does that person cost over the course of his or her lifetime? And the total amount was $1.25 million, outright cost. We're talking about now a turn of a million and a half dollars between the value of one who contributes to the state and the other one who costs the taxpayers a million and a quarter dollars. So when people say, I don't wanna hear about that morality, I wanna talk about money. Well, I do too. I wanna to talk about how much it costs for us to be a nation that fails in our moral teaching because the cost is extraordinary. When people grow up without an understanding that we are to do unto others as we would have others do unto us, if we fail to live by what we all grew up with and what my mother drilled into me as a kid, the golden rule, and if we fail to live by that, the simple words of Jesus who said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, not do unto others before they do it unto you, if we live by that moral code, do you ever stop to realize that we would not need hardly any of the laws we, we already have? There would be no domestic violence if we all lived by that simple golden rule. Nobody would ever beat a spouse up because they wouldn't want to be beaten up by their spouse. Nobody would ever burglarize a home because nobody ever wants their home to be burglarized. I've never said that I can imagine anyone sitting around on their porch saying, I hope somebody breaks in and burglarizes us tonight. There's some stuff in here we just don't need and it's just too hard to put it out to the curb. Maybe we'll get robbed. <laughs> nobody would ever commit an armed robbery because nobody ever wants a gun stuck in his face and said, give me your money. <clears throat> nobody would ever be murdered. Nobody would ever be raped. No child would ever be sexually assaulted. Imagine living in a community where everyone lived by the golden rule. Oh, it, it's even more amazing than that. Nobody would ever show up for work late. Nobody would ever leave early. Nobody would ever steal from the boss, whether it's stealing the inventory or the time for which the boss is paying that person. 
Nobody would ever call in sick when they really weren't. Do you realize how cheap insurance would be if nobody stole, nobody drove drunk, nobody even broke the speeding laws? I probably was doing all right until I got to that one. <laughs> well, the fact is, when people say we don't want to hear about morality, we just want to hear about a smaller government, folks, we can't have a smaller government until we have a bigger character among us living a life of morality and living a life accountable and responsible to God. Jesus said that we are the salt of the earth and we are the light of the world. I think so many times people think of salt as the seasoning that's on your table. But in the first century when Jesus used that as a metaphor, that is not at all what he was talking about. Because in those days when Jesus was walking around the Sea of Galilee and calling people like Peter and Andrew and John, the fishermen, to come and follow him, if he were to say, you're the salt of the earth to them, they understood that he wasn't talking about the seasoning. He was talking about the preservative qualities of salt. There were no refrigerations, no ice chest. Any of you got a Yeti cooler? <laughs> Amazing. I mean, it's really an incredible thing. It's expensive, but a Yeti cooler, I mean, they didn't exist in the first century. Too bad they didn't. It's like the thermos. It keeps cold things cold and hot things hot. Somebody once said, this is what this does. Guy looked at it, he'd never seen one before. He said, what? Yeah, it keeps cold things cold, hot things hot. Guy looked at it and says, how do it know? <laughs> Slower crowd in Houston, I can tell you that now. No, there was no way to, to refrigerate the fish that came out of the water, and as soon as it came out of the water, it started putrefying and spoiling, so the only thing to do was to pack it in salt, which was a preservative. So when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, here's what he meant. If the world is rotting, if it's getting to the place where it's a stench. If the earth, if the culture we live in is putrefying and decaying, then preserve it. Those who follow Christ are the preservative. You're the salt. And if you're not salting the culture, if you're not preserving it, it's going to spoil. I don't know why on earth we always get amazed that our culture is spiraling into hell when the fact is, of course it is. Because we lack salt. College of Biblical Studies is Houston's salt mine. That's why it's important. And Jesus said, you're the light of the world. And by the way, there's no point in having a light in a well-lit room. I know some people that believe they're wonderful Christians because every Sunday at church, they're good Christians. Well, that's a real tough one, isn't it? I rarely hear cursing at my church. My job at my church, I drive the golf cart in the parking lot and take people from their cars to the door. They finally found something they thought I could do. I put people in the car, they look at me and say, has anybody ever told you you look like Mike Huckabee? I say, I get that a lot. Why, you even sound like him. I get that too. And then when they say, are you really Mike Huckabee? Yeah, I am. Oh, you are not. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's just they don't expect to see me driving around the golf cart hauling people into the church. Well, I can tell you this, I, I can behave pretty well at church too. Most of the people I carry into the church, all nice people. I never see anybody bringing a six pack into the church with them. Nobody's ever got a little brown bag, hide it in their shirt saying, this is in case the sermon goes on too long. <laughs> I've never been offered drugs driving the golf cart. I was a pretty clean bunch of people to go to church. Because it's easy to be a good Christian at church. Easiest job I've ever had. You know where it's tough? It's tough working in a legislative environment. It's tough working in a political climate. It's tough working in a media environment in New York City. There it's harder to be light, because all around us, there's darkness. Jesus never said, 
you're the light of the world, but just keep it in the well-lit rooms. It'll be more comfortable. When he said you're the light of the world, he meant go where the darkest places are and whatever light you have, shine it in those places because it'll make a difference. That's where the light needs to be. When I was 15 years old, just shy of my 16th birthday, I went to Expo 72 in Dallas, Texas, 1972, June. It was an incredible event. Many of you too young to even know about it, but it was in essence sort of the culmination of the Jesus movement that had started in the late 60s and blossomed in the early 70s. And many of us of my generation were really confronted with the gospel through the Jesus movement and transformed by the gospel as a result of the Jesus movement when the traditional church was simply not speaking to us anymore. And the Jesus movement spoke in our music, it spoke in our culture and in our language, and a lot of people in the traditional church hated it. But for those of us who were teenagers who were trying to find something in life, it was the lifeline. Explo 72, sponsored by Campus Crusade for Christ, happened in Dallas, Texas. 100,000 Christian young people from all over the world gathered in Dallas, Texas for Explo 72. Training for evangelism during the day, and in the evening we'd go to the Cotton Bowl in Dallas for massive Christian rallies led by amazing singers and speakers. And on the last night, Dr. Billy Graham was the speaker. And I'll never forget his message. He told us that we were the light of the world. As we had come into the Cotton Bowl that night, everybody was handled, uh, handed a little candle and told to hang on to it. As he came to the conclusion of the message, Dr. Graham lit his candle and he turned to Dr. Bill Bright, the head of Campus Crusade for Christ, and he lit Dr. Bright's candle. Now there were two candles that were lit. All of the lights in the Cotton Bowl were turned off. Every last one had pitch dark in the Cotton Bowl. Now the two candles were turned and shared, and they became four candles. And everyone with the candles then lit others, and the four became eight, and then 16, and 32, and 64. And within a matter of seconds, it was stunning how quickly it happened. But as people doubled the number of lit candles every second, the flames of those candles just began to flow throughout the stadium to the point that there was an orange glow over the Cotton Bowl that night that was just absolutely amazing. So much so that people in the Fair Park area of Dallas where the Cotton Bowl was located were calling the Dallas Fire Department to say, the Cotton Bowl is on fire. <laughs> and it was. But in a way, the Fire Department could never have quenched it. Yeah, something was going on that night. And I'll never forget the glow of 100,000 candles illuminating the sky of Dallas as everybody was being reminded that we are the light of the world. But I'll tell you what I remembered as vividly as 100,000 candles. It was what it looked like when in the pitch blackness with all the lights turned off, Billy Graham's single candle was lit. And through the darkness, I sat way back up probably 120 yards from where he was in the nosebleed section at the other end of the Cotton Bowl. And yet I could see the flicker of that tiny candle because in darkness even a little bit of light makes a difference and my friend maybe you think how can we have that big of an impact on prostitution and drug dealing and gangs there's so many people involved in this subculture. How can we penetrate it? How can we change it? How can we bring light to it? I'll tell you, one candle at a time. And every person you help to be part of the College of Biblical Studies, you're helping to light a candle. And that candle's going into the darkest places in Houston. Not to the well-lit rooms, but to the darkest places in your city. And with all my heart, I believe this, that Jesus, when he said that his word will never return unto him void, that means that that little light going into the dark places will never be snuffed out because sin isn't big enough to snuff out the light of God's gospel. Thank you for what you're doing with the College of Biblical Studies. God bless you.